All right. Welcome back to the show. The opening. See, we wanted to get any technical issues out of the way right away with this show today. So I apologize. Hey, my name is Mike Sempervivi. Brian Alvarez not here today, but you already know that. Just have a whole batch of technical issues because he's not here, so he can come back and make fun of me on those. But uh, now that everything is fixed and, and, and straight, we got to have a lot to get into. Not the least of which, of course, is WWE SmackDown and AEW Rampage tonight. One hundred percent less Mike Tyson on that show, and uh, we'll get into all of it when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper VB here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. We do this show right here for an hour at a time. But if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter. I am at Semper VB. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. Also, wouldn't hurt my feelings if you made the wrestling news part of your day. We give you all the up-to-date professional wrestling news that you need to get your day started or to get you up-to-date every single day. Uploaded at approximately 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Usually between anywhere between 7 and about 15 minutes long. Just go to the wrestlingnews.com and at wrestlingnewsav on Twitter. If you want Brian Alvarez because you missed Brian Alvarez today and after that first segment, I, I got to be honest, I couldn't blame you. But he's offering super followers or super follows to anyone who, who is interested in following exclusive tweets, scoops, Q&As and more, all with the added bonus of being a super follower of Brian Alvarez. He's going to thank you in his mentions. And, you know, if you're not interested, that's fine. His normal cesspool uh, timeline remains. And I'm sure he's going to have something to say. You see on the back of this gimmick here, there's two plugs where you plug in the microphone. I was just in a rush, so I just threw it in this hole right here. And, you know, as has been proven time and time again, you stick it in the wrong hole, you're going to get a negative reaction, you know, a lot of the time. So... That's uh, that's unfortunately what happened there in the first segment, but we are back on track here on Wrestling Observer Live. That's the kind of professionalism that Mike Sempervivi brings you every single day here on this show, at least Monday through Friday. And I got to have another mea culpa here because yesterday on the show, I was curious as to when AEW would be heading over to England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales and anywhere else they're going to go over there. And, uh, Shame on me for missing Tony Schiavone's announcement during Wednesday night's Dynamite broadcast that the company has actually already decided that, and they'll be making their way over to the U.K. next year, their first jaunt outside North America. And I should have known, you know, Tony Khan tweeting something yesterday about U.K. viewership numbers and crediting the ITV head of scheduling strategy, John Williams, and revealing that the show was up double digits since last year, year over year in September and October, and that the October 28th edition of the program was the most watched ever on ITV, drew an average viewership of a little over 200,000 people. So I'm not sure what the fight TV numbers are over there, but obviously fans want them to come over. There's enough of them on our website. There's enough of them, I'm sure, listening to this show right now in the chat who would really like them to come over. And no word on dates or specific locations yet, but it, it, it only makes sense, you know, that you know, and Tony Khan has said this in past interviews that bringing AEW to London's Craven Cottage, and that's the home venue of the Fulham Football Club, which his father owns. That place fits a little under 23,000 people. So if you include field seating, that could be a gigantic show for them. It's going to be huge anyway, since it's going to be their first one. But it is a, a place that I'm sure he'll get a break on rent. <laughs> I'm not sure how nasty the old man is about that sort of thing. And I'm not sure how many concerts or other types of things are are actually taking place there. Uh, you know, it's in London, so it's not like there's not a lot of venues around. So I'm not sure how often this thing gets used for anything other than football matches. But, you know, again, it the, makes the most sense for AEW to go over and run at least one show. Obviously, whatever their big show, whatever their cornerstone show of that weekend or week is going to be, you know, a Dynamite there, a pay-per-view there, something like that probably going to be a, a pretty good atmosphere but 
We'll rewind here a couple of days because everybody likes to fight over it. The ratings came out. AEW Dynamite averaged 930,000 viewers on TBS, up 2.1% from last week. But it's also the third lowest audience total for the show since July 20th. In the 18-49 to 49 demo, Dynamite finished sixth on the cable charts with a .32 rating up over 10% from last week when the show went against the World Series. And that demo number equates to approximately 400 and 17,000 viewers. Essentially, these are the exact same numbers that they were doing last year with the exact same type of competition. This week's main sports competition for them came from, no surprise, the NBA, the New York Knicks, and the Brooklyn Nets on ESPN, which did a .43 in the 18-49 to 49 demo. That game was going on with Kyrie Irving's head assery swirling around the NBA and swirling around New York. And the other cable competition came from the talking head shows and all the political pundits uh, talking about Tuesday's midterm elections in the United States. So Dynamite's ratings were actually up in every demo from last week. The exception was people over 50. I guess they got their fill of NXT the night before, and they were just too tuckered out to watch two wrestling shows back to back. But when you really, when you look at what keeps pro wrestling afloat, it is absolutely positively people over 50 years old 484,000 viewers over 50 percent of the viewership 52 percent of the viewership that's why i always like kind of like look at the 35 to 49 numbers the 18 to 34s are obviously important for a lot of reasons but it's like if you can hook somebody uh, at by 34 years old you know 35 years old with all the life changes you get married you have kids you change jobs you move you do all that sort of stuff you have all these other real life distractions and things in, in going on if you're still a wrestling fan by that point you're pretty much going to be locked in until you die that's <laughs> at least or at least until nxt goes off the air for that night but uh quarter hours you know looking at them there were really no failures or successes this is one of the more evenly viewed aew programs from the beginning to end than i can remember and i know brian always says that i oversell the fact that the show really does fall off as it goes on rampage rampage is a little bit of a different story but dynamite the same way too but looking at the numbers the only negative for them was not being able to keep whatever the lead in was which i i don't know i think it was the big bang theory i think that's what it usually is at least but they did lose 129,000 viewers between the first and second segments they started off at 1.078 million that was the high water mark for the night and then dropped to 949,000 uh for the second segment so from there it really does stay even there was a dip Right before the show was to go off the air, it was 854000 for Jamie Hayter and Sky Blue during that segment that took place between 9.30 and 9.45, but it did bump back up again for Sammy Guevara and Brian Danielson. The conclusion of that match finished with 861,000 viewers there, so... With all that said, the wackiest AEW rating scenario came out of Canada, and Post Wrestling's John Pollock always keeps everybody in the loop on how TV does up north, and Wednesday's Dynamite's numbers just absolutely collapsed. This is only the English language estimate, as RDS carries the French, French language version, but Dynamite only did 33,000 viewers, and 17,000 in the 25 to 54-year-old demographic on TSN2. That's down nearly two-thirds of their audience from last week, which was 93,000 and 46,500 between 25 and 54. There were apparently significant technical issues throughout the first 30 minutes of that program. Really choppy audio throughout the opening eight-man, uh, wrote John Pollock, and it didn't correct itself until the MJF promo, so... E, you know, something completely out of their control, but still nasty to see when you're going to have to look and stare up at that number and realize that it was absolutely nothing to do with you that caused the havoc with all of that. But speaking of AEW, Rampage tonight, TBS here in the United States, pre-taped following Wednesday's Dynamite in Boston. Main event is going to be Orange Cassidy defending his All-Atlantic title against Lee Johnson. There are also two matches in the World Title Contenders Tournament with Brian Cage facing Dante Martin and Roosh against Bandito. Uh, Lance Archer and Ricky Starks was scheduled until Archer attacked him backstage on Dynamite. So not sure if that match is going to be rescheduled to Wednesday. Not sure if it's 
just not going to happen now. And that's a way for somebody to get a buy and, and either do something and angle leading into winter is coming or, you know, give yourself a little bit of time. Not exactly sure, but bottom line is there's only going to be two tournament matches tonight, plus Nyla Rose against Kayla Sparks, and that's it as far as matches go. They do tease a future matchup uh, that has got to do with the FTW title. So we'll get into SmackDown and everything else going on in the news when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Semper VV here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Yes, this is a Baltimore Colts throwback jersey, G. Marchetti. Yes, it is. A lot of people ask, how did you become a fan of the Atlanta Falcons? Well, my father was a big New York Giants fan and we lived outside Washington, D.C. And I had the foresight to know that that is a trash franchise. So I rooted for the Baltimore Colts until they left town in the middle of the night. And then I just picked the team at the time that was at the top of the alphabet. That was the Atlanta Falcons. Thank God Arizona was still in St. Louis at the time. But that's how my torture began. But you know what? i got to even things out here. Sorry for the ASMR kids that usually are looking forward to the Red Bull cracking open. There was none of that in the fridge, so we're going to have to go with the 20-ounce bottle of Coke here. Ah, there you go. I was going to actually get back into what was taking place tonight on TV when it comes to SmackDown, but... Then I opened up my email during the break and got this press release from Dana White. UFC President Dana White announced today. Sorry, I don't want to lie about what it says here in the uh, in the uh, the copy. But UFC President Dana White today announced the launch of Power Slap, a sanctioned and regulated combat sport focused on competitive open hand striking. Formed by Dana White, Lorenzo Fertitta, and Craig Pilligan in partnership with the Ultimate Fighting Championship and Endeavor and produced by Pilgrim Media Group, Power Slap will feature competitors from across the globe competing on the ultimate stage to showcase their power, technique, and resolve. And this is what stood out to me as interesting. The Sport Power Slap will launch with an eight-episode series that will air on TBS in early 2023, where athletes will compete to earn a spot in the cast house, the first Power Slap rankings, and future Power Slap matches in world recognition. For open hand slap fighting, where people just sit there and slap each other with an open hand in the face and pray that they don't have an errant hand go off and shatter their eardrums. But coming to TBS, don't tell me, don't tell me that there's not a little bit of space on the schedule uh, for for AEW in some form, uh, a second show that is. I know Dynamite's fine, but Rampage and All Women Show and ROH Show. Look, if they're going with cheaper programming, which obviously this is, and I'm not trying to shade the concept, although I think it's that's kind of cheap too. But you know, when you have what is essentially going to be somebody else producing it for them. Spending a lot of the costs, you know, I'm sure they're obviously TBS is going to kick out some money for all this sort of stuff. But I mean, you know, it's cheap reality based programming with with slap fighters in a house like it's the ultimate fighter, the ultimate slap fighter. It's, it's coming to be. So, I, yeah. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe we get to see a lead in now for Rampage on Friday nights. I, I'm being dead serious there, you know, <laughs> so to have that at nine o'clock leading into Rampage at 10. I don't know, but that is something. I, I guess I'm, I, I'm really surprised that it's TBS of, of, and not in ESPN outlet or something like that. But there you go. I figured yeah, that was something made for a Fox Sports or something like that. But this is what the new TBS and TNT and I guess uh, Warner Brothers deal is all looking like now. So there you go. Uh, and before I get to SmackDown on Fox 2, Bandito's contract, uh, some contract, uh, a little bit about it has been revealed by Dave Meltzer uh, in this week's Observer Newsletter. He reported that it's a full-time deal for three years, but has a maximum number of dates on it. And while Meltzer didn't have the exact number of dates, he was told it is more matches than most AEW wrestlers work in a year now. So that shouldn't be an issue, but that could change if they start doing house shows. 
While Bandito was initially thought to be signing with AEW following his post-Chris Jericho Dynamite match contract offer, he did get an offer from WWE that he was mulling over before doing so. And in that time, he went over to Russell for Glate. And uh, that match is up on YouTube. It was he and Commander in a match that was absolutely awesome, teaming together in a tag match. That was really, really cool, and that's up for free on Glate's YouTube site over at uh, the Japanese-based company. It does a lot of uh, shoot-style fighting. And the reasons for Bandito choosing AEW, pretty simple. They were family-related. His significant other does not want to move from Mexico, and he's got a child there. And working for WWE, where it's assumed he would begin in NXT, would require him to be based in Florida, and with any other main roster call up like any other main roster call up it's probably going to keep him away from home a lot longer and more than he wanted to be so there you go bandito uh again this is why would somebody sign with aew over wwe some of the real life flexibility that that seem that you seem to get and obviously in wwe you can get to a certain point you can become a randy orton an undertaker somebody like that and ray mysterio with limited dates and things like that but as far as they're concerned, Bandito is a unknown commodity, so he's pretty much going to be at their beck and call, uh, unfortunately. So probably the right move made for him going with AEW makes life a lot easier, especially going in and out of Mexico. SmackDown, Fox tonight, Gainbridge Fieldhouse in downtown Indianapolis. This is the home of the Indiana Pacers. And on paper, it is sounding like it's going to be a great atmosphere there. According to WrestleTix uh, this morning, and this is what they put on their Patreon, there are 8,661 tickets distributed for the show, which would only be 482 shy of a sellout. So the way they have the building configured, it's 9,140. 43 person capacity the last time they were in the building they drew 5080 for a raw on february 14th so probably by the time the show begins the deal is going to be sold out essentially they're going to say it's sold out anyway and the biggest thing on it that we know of right now is the new day trying to prevent jay and jimmy uso from breaking their record for being the longest reigning tag team champions in wwe history it's kind of funny they wouldn't be the longest reigning champions in on raw for their reign so far that's only 175 days but when you include smackdown now you're up to 481 days at least according to cage match and there's a little bit of a difference between cage match and wwe apparently is cage match has new day uh holding their titles for 483 days so they would not technically pass them tonight, but by the time the weekend is over, and I doubt there's going to be any house shows where the Usos will be dropping the belts, they should actually hold the record for the all-time longest reign in uh, WWF Tag Team Championship history. Pre-brand split, Demolition had the longest one. They had a 478-day reign that ended up getting bested by the Brain Busters in 1988 and into 1989. So also tonight, the beginning of the World Cup on Fox because the World Cup is beginning and this is synergy or vulturism or a little bit of both. But uh, there's supposed to be a trophy present and everyone can stare at that trophy when they walk down to the ring and they walk back from the ring and they can stare at it with desire. They can just kind of like, you know, kind of descend, you know, feels off to it or maybe they can point at it. You know, they'll probably be doing a little of that. So, you know, you got a trophy just like the World Cup has a trophy and somebody's going to win this thing at some point. Santos Escobar, repping Mexico, will be facing off against Japan Shinsuke Nakamura. And got to believe that's going to be really good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm going off of Shinsuke's a lot older now, but those matches that he had with Andrade, the matches he had with Andrade's, uh, Alter Ego La Sombra, when they were feuding over the Intercontinental title in New Japan, that was good stuff. Santos Escobar is really good, and I'm not sure about Legado de Fantasma. The way, they, the way they've been brought up to the roster, the way they were kind of thrown in there with Hit Row, it was not the best debut. It's not the... Uh, 
auspicious debut uh, for them. Uh, and so I hope they can kind of get some bit things back on track. And a Santos Escobar singles match with Shinsuke Nakamura should go a long way in kind of showing off his wares. Hard to believe that that won't be a really, really good match. Hopefully, for me, being half Italian, I hope this thing does really ring true to life and Giovanni Vinci is uh, – beaten in a qualifying match by somebody from North Macedonia. I know they don't have anybody from North Macedonia, but you could probably put a mask on somebody like they used to do to Spanky, Brian Kendrick, back in the day. They wrestled at the Meadowlands. He put on a mask. He'd be the New Jersey Devil, get a roll-up victory, big surprise. It was a Paul Heyman thing that they had going on. This would be another good time for Paul Heyman to break that back out because, yeah, Italy's not in the World Cup because they lost to North Macedonia at home. They did. It's pathetic. It's sad. Thank God Dom is not here. He'd be making fun of me and my headset right now, and the only thing I could be able to throw back at him is four World Cups, and that's cool, except they're not here now. Now I know how America feels all the time with this sort of stuff, but, oh, man, the, the pain, the agony. CM Punk's had pain and agony, but now he's found a way to fill a little bit of his downtime as he recovers from both his triceps injury and his uh, time in AEW because of all these buyout rumors that are going on. Punk made his first public appearance out there since the ill-fated all-out post-show press scrum on September 5th. He returned to the MMA booth for Cage Fury Fighting Champions number 114 last night on the ESPN Plus UFC Fight Pass service. Punk's done commentary for for the group in the past and he did so right up until signing with AEW in August of 2021. Punk originally began working for CFFC in November of 2018 but he stopped announcing shows when he signed on but now with his injury and the fact that his status with AEW is currently up in the air he he needed something to do. He did get in a little line as he was being introduced for the broadcast by saying well let's never do that again so... If you want to look at that as one of the tea leaves, but uh, CM Punk back doing something that he really actually loves to do and enjoys. Hopefully they, nothing happens with that one. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper VV with you. Wrestling Observer Live here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. A score one in the win column for Game Changer Wrestling. Triple A Mega Champion El Hio. Del Vikingo will be making his American Wrestling debut on December 16th for GCW. Vikingo will be appearing at GCW's America's Most Wanted event, taking place at the Ukrainian Cultural Center in Cultural Center, if I could say that, in Los Angeles. The 25-year-old Vikingo, who has been with AAA since 2017, has been mega champion for 11 months, obtained his U.S. work visa last month, but a dislocated elbow he sustained on October 31st has kept him out of action since delaying his American debut. He is expected to be cleared for action well before the December 16th date. GCW's only announced one match for that show so far, and it's a trios match that on paper is awesome. It's Gringo Loco and Los Vipers facing Ares, ASF, and Commander. And I mentioned Commander earlier on, a team with Bandito that he had in Glate. He's something else, and I've seen Antonio San Francisco live. He is incredible as well, too. So that is a, a hell of a match, whatever else they're going to add here. As of now, that they, uh, they've also announced Pagano is going to be coming in. GCW World, uh, World Champion Nick Gage is going to be there. Masha Slamovich, Jack Cartwheel, Sawyer Wreck, Nick Wayne, Joey Janela, and Effie are all signed up for the show. So good news there for GCW. I guess still bad news for NWA leading into Hard Times 3 here. That is taking place this weekend. We've had uh, Luke Hawks on. We've had Joe Galley on talking about the event. But unfortunately, much of the talk, much of the talk has been around Billy Corgan and Nick Aldis and Nick Aldis leaving the NWA. We've had talk about Empower and them not holding another show Billy Corgan gave his thoughts on the matter, and we, Brian and I, both gave our thoughts on Billy's thoughts, which were, you probably should have parsed your words a little bit more, probably didn't have to say some of the things that you did and kind of frame it in the way that you did. Basically, 
making it sound to a lot of people that there is not a lot of female wrestling talent out there to actually hold an empower card. Uh, those people would say you're just not looking hard enough. You're not digging hard enough. You're not paying enough, whatever it is. But Trevor Murdoch uh, chimed in and I will say Trevor Murdoch was a close ally and student of Harley Race. That's going to come up uh, here again in a little bit, but I want you to, you know, that's should be noted about Trevor Murdoch because what Nick Aldis uh, says a little bit later on. But when <laughs> with a interview, my friend Sean Radigan over at PW Torch uh, interviewed Trevor he said, quote, when it came down for the second in power, there isn't a book out there that just has every great female wrestler out there. And we can just look into it and go, we get this person, that person, this person. Granted, I know there's a ton of fans out there that can give me a list of 10 or 20 people that they know in their area that can fit on a show. In the same sense, I understand you're fans of these women, but maybe they haven't done what they need to do to stand out, to get the attention that they need to. He also says there's more factors and uh, people jump on the negative and, and all that sort of stuff. But again, I don't know if that was needed to be said. There is actually a book. It's the PWI 150 that just came out with a bunch of female wrestling talent. In fact, 150 names of them, some of which you couldn't get because they're signed with other companies or they are in Japan right now. But you know, <laughs> it's 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 not like there's not other people out there. So I'm not sure if Trevor Murdoch helped the cause there by saying anything. Now, get over to another one of Harley Race's, uh, I want to say one of his favorite students. Trevor Murdoch was an actual student of Harley's at the old WLW in Eldon, Missouri, and actually worked at Harley Race's bar uh, <laughs> at that time as well, too. They were very, very close. But Nick Aldis also was close to Harley Race and certainly has a spiritual connection to him uh, when it comes to professional wrestling. And this is up on the main page of our site today. In fact, right now, Ian Carey posted it up. Nick Aldis says he's not sure how he would justify the current NWA product to Harley Race. On Sunday, Aldis posted a since-deleted video to his Instagram stating that he was leaving the company. Those who saw the video say Aldis called the NWA product, quote, embarrassing and said he didn't want to be part of it anymore. The two-time former NWA World Heavyweight Champion spoke with Sam Roberts recently and clarified his comments, quote, it certainly wasn't intended to be this burial of the NWA or anything like that, unquote. Why would I do that? I would be burying myself. Aldis would later discuss the NWA product straying away from what he originally envisioned it to be. And this is a, a long write-up that they have. Uh, I'll give you a couple of notes from it. And uh, Aldis said the product, he felt the product went downhill after NWA 73 and in him losing the world title. And... How happy was Nick Aldis to lose the title? Mm, uh, well, <laughs> he says, quote, I was presented with the question, what's different now? Why is it not working now compared to what? And I sort of went, again, you're forcing me into giving you an answer that paints me in this awful light. But I'm going, the difference is you had a world title angle that people were interested in, and now you don't. So as soon as the belt went off of him and got in the mix with Tyrus and Murdoch and Cardona, um, it lost some appeal, uh, says uh, Nick Aldis here. He also says the title picture did improve and Matt Cardona was added to the mix, but after Cardona was injured, things fell apart again. He said he was then accused of lobbying for himself to get the belt back. And Aldis said that in late September, his wife, Mickey James, told him about a conversation she'd had with Billy Corgan. He says, this is Aldis, quote, he and Mickey had a private conversation that he didn't realize I was privy to and goes, your husband is pressuring me to put the belt back on him. And you know, for me, the day I went, this isn't going to work. 
Aldis continued to say that the NWA product also began to go downhill when Corgan became more hands-on with the product. Quote, look, the sad truth is, and I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this, but basically things got harder when he became more hands-on because at first he was quite hands-off, quite remote, and he was just sort of lending ideas and sort of notes here and there. Suddenly it turned into something else, and I'll try to be as nice as I can about this. He's just not very good at it. I'm sorry, it's He's not very good at it. I added the just there. I shouldn't have done that. I wish it wasn't the case, but again, it's not really for me to say. It's the audience to say, and my decision to leave has come from the fact that the audience has left in droves. It's just not a good decision to be there anymore. It's not a viable option. Uh, and says, quote, look, I can't get around it. I'm not saying all of it, but they, but there was enough of it that, for me, didn't pass the Harley race test. And I know people will hear that and be like, Harley, what the hell? But you have to understand Harley race wanted nothing to do with the NWA because of what it had been prior, because it had some pretty dark days. And then talks about wanting to be associated with, again, asking Nick Aldis to come to Missouri and, and talk about all that stuff about being the NWA champion and... Well, there you go. There you go. Once again, we're going into Hard Times 3 here this weekend, and the only talk going on is from Nick Aldis and Billy Corrigan back and forth and about a pay-per-view uh, that doesn't even exist anymore with Empower. So just not not the way that they wanted to go into things. Maybe this somehow will be a positive for them. Uh, I don't know how it's drummed up any interest at all, unfortunately. So, you know, it's there's more of what Nick Aldis has to say up on the main page of the WrestlingObserver.com uh, website. I told you about that. I don't know what promotion he could possibly go to that Harley Race wouldn't be spinning in his grave a little bit over. I mean... I, there's very few. I mean, there's almost none that don't bring in something that it, somebody from the old school probably wouldn't like, you know, just, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's, it's too bad because we could use a third option. And I don't know if ROH is going to be that option once Tony Khan rolls it out, but we do need a third promotion here. I'm not saying that we absolutely have to have one with all the indies around, but it would be kind of nice to actually have a third national option. And I know, well, there's impact, but unfortunately impacts in the same boat as the NWA. There's been so much damage done to that name over time that I just don't know. I'm not even sure ROH, really. And again, it's going to depend because it's got the money behind it uh, with Tony Khan, because he's got a lot of drive behind it and he wants to do something with it. Maybe it can overcome its name. But unfortunately, you know, the NWA TNA impact, ROH... I don't know how much it, it means right now. If Tony Khan were to rebrand Ring of Honor and bring it back under a different name with just a completely different look, again, I don't know if that's that probably wouldn't be the best thing either, I guess, since you have AEW to worry about. So, I mean, the tape library and all that other stuff that you get. But I, I don't know what the answer is when it comes to the NWA at all, other than they better hope that all this stuff is really, really far behind them here. And they can actually drum up a little bit of interest in those shows and some more shows moving forward. But some people that are going to be wrestling on that NWA show include Matt Cardona and Chelsea Green. Even though she's got one foot out the door to WWE, had her last match in Impact, which aired last night. And uh, according to Fightful Select... And this is the Entertainment Tonight portion of the proceedings. They were on hand to wish congratulations to Deanna Perrazzo and Steve Macklin, who got married recently. Uh, part of the guest list who made the wedding were Green and Cardona, along with Britt Baker and Adam Cole, Wendy Chu, Santana Garrett, Zoe Lucas. Is Zoe Lucas in the States, like on a regular basis? If she is, you know, people should be using her. <laughs> they really should. Tasha Steeles and referees uh, Adrian Butler and Sean Bennett were also credited as to going to the uh, to the wedding. So congratulations to Deanna and Steve Macklin on their nuptials there. So all the best to them. I'm sure you I was going to you know what I was actually going to run down and take a look at the WWE Performance Center 15 people that they signed on the non-wrestlers that they signed up from their NIL program but the hell with it you know I had this sitting here cuz I was looking at it earlier on uh going through some stuff and it's the WWE program 
number 225 there with Lex Luger and Yokozuna on the cover. This was from the Friday, October 14th show that took place at the Baltimore Arena. And I know I'm holding up the card for everybody that's driving down the road to not be able to see there. But you see The Undertaker, Yoko in the casket match. Jim Jim Neidhart and Bret Hart for the world title. Yes, that actually happened. Lex Luger, Tatanka. And you see the uh, the rundown of the card there. But also, you know, when you would go to shows, just like now when people are handing out their cards and and, and different flyers for events, they, they did that back in the day, too. And uh, they went around and everybody for the Mid-Eastern Wrestling Federation. This is uh, pre-Maryland Championship Wrestling. But look at that lineup for tonight. On this night, November 11th, Friday night, at the Catonsville National Guard Armory. Catonsville, by the way, is where everybody runs at UMBC, that Chesapeake Employers Arena. Same spot. Look at that bad boy. Brutus the Barber Beefcake against the Warlord in the main event. And Road Warrior Hawk along with the Ultimate Comet against Hollywood Bob Star and Lucifer. Because you need the money. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Mike Semper VB Wrestling Observer Live, putting a bow on this thing. At least the weekday edition of the program. Myself and Brian Alvarez will be back with you on Monday afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, noon Pacific. If you just can't wait and you need a little bit more Wrestling Observer Live, don't worry. It is here for you seven days a week. Mr. Jim Valley is going to be in this chair tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 Pacific. And also, Andrew Zarian fills this slot, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and 3 o'clock Pacific. That is on Sunday evenings. And uh, as I'm staring here, more at this Mid-Eastern Wrestling Federation flyer. Also appearing on the undercard of Brutus the Barber Beefcake against the Warlord. And I love how they, they actually write this out here. And not as much this one. Former WCW Tag Team Champion Cactus Jack. No, it's the next one. The man who Bob Backlund gave up to and former WWF heavyweight champion, the Iron Sheik. I can just see that being some of the copy that they send down to local promoters that they have to use when introducing the Iron Sheik. He made the Bob Backlund go ahead and give up. And uh, Bob Backlund was back in the, the news there. And since this was 1994 and they had to deal with him and, and Bret Hart uh, not long before this, but... You know, I wonder if Dennis Corluzzo had a show in New Jersey on Saturday because they're not back until Sunday where you get Road Warrior Hawk against the Warlord and what was sure to be a technical classic alongside Brutus the Barber Beefcake against the Iron Sheik. Where was the show taking place, you may say, on Sunday, November 13th? The new Bingo Bills on the corner of Eastern Avenue and Stemmer's Run Road in Essex, Maryland. Oh, Essex. So, yeah, you want to say, oh, where do they get that with running bingo halls all the time? There were a lot of bingo halls, I guess, in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland that these people love to run. So there you go. And I don't hear any music. I don't know what's going on, but I know we're getting close to the end of this show. So I shall talk to you again. Thank you, Producer John. Thank you, Producer Daniel. We shall talk to you all again after a while.